I remember when we were younger. We would sit atop the big hill just beyond Falcon's Reach and watch the airships passing by. Those giant Zeppelin vessels that seem so removed from you and I, from our little life, and yet sometimes they felt so close, like if we jumped high enough, we could reach out and touch one of the flags that trailed just behind the cabin hold. We would make up stories about where the airships were coming from and where they were going to. Once, we saw a particular ship that had a black flag on it, flapping in the wind. And we decided then that it was a pirate ship. Not ordinary pirates, though. Oh no, these were sky pirates. And they would sail the clouds, heading north to the coasts of Palagos, the land of many wonders. The sky pirates would raid regular pirates, we said. Their ship would come racing from behind a big, puffy cloud and engage the sea pirates below, whose cannons couldn't point up that far. So they'd be forced to fight with their swords and hooks. The sky pirates would come down on ropes from above, firing hand crossbows as they did, and shouting out victory cries, because they already knew they'd won. I remember we said that one day, we were going to be sky pirates, and we'd have an airship of our own. It didn't matter that you were a girl. Girls could be sky pirates on our ship. We would call ourselves the Golden Hawks. You said that our doublets and our hand crossbows would have golden emblems upon them so that our foes would know who we were. I said, no, we have to have something better than that. We have to put mirrors all over the cabin hold and they will reflect the sunlight and shine so bright that it will blind our opponents. We promised not to tell anyone about our secret mirror beam tactic, lest it would get stolen and used by others. I remember when we asked my mother how much it would cost to board an airship and sail away on the wind to the far off places they go to. It would cost a lot of money. How much is that? Probably over a hundred gold pieces. More than we'll ever have to spend. More than a hundred gold pieces? We said to each other, as we thought. We didn't know how much that was exactly. We tried looking around to find money, because surely if we looked hard enough, we'd find some every day. After all, people drop things, and lose things, and forget things, and after a while, we would have collected enough to go on an airship. However, we quickly began to discover that people don't accidentally lose money very often, in the way that they do other things. I recall one day, we came upon a fountain in town and there were two copper coins in it. I reached in and I got wet all the way up to my shoulders, but I plucked the coins out of the water. An old man passing by stopped and frowned at us. Those are somebody's wishes! We didn't know what to say. You are stealing somebody else's wishes, young man! You ought to put those back. I wanted to run off, to take the coins, because I had my wishes too, and they weren't going to go anywhere, sitting at the bottom of a fountain. You looked scared and really nervous, so I apologized and put the copper pieces back. I remember telling my father that I wanted to go on an airship and fly away to a land filled with different people. 
He scoffed at me. Where would you want to go to, huh? I'd like to maybe go to Sune. Well, things are different over there. You have to work really hard, and you can't make very much money. And you have to be really respectful to those above you. You have to bow to the samurai and to the nobles, because if you don't, they might execute you. They'll do that to show everyone how serious they are. I didn't say anything back, because that wasn't the experience that I imagined. When I thought of flying to the Far East, I thought of tranquil gardens and mountain shrines, and of the chance to see one of the spirits that were said to reside in the special places there. My father and mother fought that night. They screamed and yelled at each other. My father slammed things and stomped the ground like thunder. My mother cried, which made her voice sound so different, so wounded. They fought about money and about the way they treated each other. I was scared and I was confused and I couldn't understand why they would do this. Why my father would sound so threatening and mean and how my mother could suffer it. As far as I could tell, living here, you had to work really hard too. And most people didn't make a lot of money. And you had to be subservient to the tyrants. My father, my teachers, and the school bullies. Otherwise, you would be faced with great anger and punishment, or even violence. As far as I could tell, things couldn't be that much different in Sune, or anywhere else for that matter. I remember when you and I got older, and we began to see each other as attractive. We began to fall in love. It felt so good to have somebody who would hold me and accept me for who I was instead of standing callously above, forcing me to fit into a mold of expectations. When we kissed, it felt like my soul could finally connect with somebody else's. And when we made love, it felt like you gave me the wings to fly out of my cage. Instead of daydreaming atop the big hill near Falcon's Reach, we would draw our own airships. We would take sticks of charcoal to big sheets of canvas, as big as we could get our hands on. And we would scribble and scratch, form lines, and shade with hatching. No longer were we foolish children with our silly designs that could never work. We were architects of the vessels of the future. We were engineers of escape plotting the paths to our wishes' fulfillment, or so we thought. I didn't notice at the time, but a subtle change began to take place, a gradual shift from dreams to wishes to goals to responsibilities to jobs. We no longer chased fireflies near the stream at night, just as we no longer chased our dreams. We spent our days working for coins, laboring for merchants and shopkeeps, trying to land better jobs at bigger businesses that catered to richer clients. And the largest wage of gold never felt as wondrous as plucking two copper pieces from a fountain of dreams after a day of honest searching. Looking back now, it seems so clear. We had bought into the illusion that pulling our heads out of the clouds and putting our hands to the grindstone would make us real. 
we had traveled from the land of dreams and nightmares to the land of the waking, the land where people become bodies and vague faces, where souls shrivel up and coins no longer represent treasure at the end of an adventure, but enslavement. We had become the people that we never understood when we were younger, when we would watch adults ignoring or resenting the children, or when we'd get scolded by an old man so ready to be cross at someone he'd never even met, and most of all, when I'd listen to my parents' horrible fighting. I remember the day that I boarded the airship and looked back to see you, tears streaming down your face. You couldn't understand why I was leaving, just as I couldn't understand why you'd given up on the girl that would lie on top of the hill, watching up above, telling stories of sky pirates, and everything we'd be someday. I thought that I would be the captain, and you would be the navigator. You would chart the course, and I would man the wheel. I thought that I would learn to be a great swordsman, and you, an expert crossbow shooter, and no adversary, not sea pirates, nor guard ships, nor monsters of the wild could take us down. Not even a dragon in all its might, could defeat the Golden Hawks, with our mirrored airship flying from cloud to cloud, beaming rays of blinding light, before swooping down to plunder and cheer. But now, as I look down from the window of my cabin, I realize I am going to have to earn my sails and my ability to fly and I am going to have to earn the sunbeams because they don't shine like that for just anyone. The pathway back to dreams is so scarcely traveled because it is not safe. You are so vulnerable while walking it, and it is lonely. The land of waking allows you to be lost in an endless crowd and find the security of attachment the anchoring weight, but the cost is your own spirit. So I have let go. My heart is racing, and my body is trembling. My next chapter is a paradox, the uncertainty of what I will find and what I will have to suffer, along with the certainty that my dream self will call me back to where I need to be.